Welcome to Passion Point. My name is Irene Becker, and I welcome you to a half hour of passion, purpose, and potential, a show that will engage you, inspire you, and hopefully add some fun to your day. Today, I'm welcoming two incredible men. One is one of Canada's leading resiliency experts, Michael Ballard. I really look forward to having a conversation with Michael Ballard. And stay tuned. We'll crank up for Passion Point. Welcome back to Passion Point. My name is Irene Becker, and I'm really happy to introduce you to Michael Ballard. It's great to be here. Thank you. Michael is one of Canada's foremost resiliency experts, and I want you to tell us about your tagline, Michael, because I love it. Uh. Resiliency for life is all about uh, bitter or better. Well, there's several different ways to have taglines, so I have several. So, you know, Ballard's the name, resiliency's the game. Well, I think... It's, it's corny. It's very nice, though. Well, Tell me why resiliency is the game. Well... Tell me about your... I mean, this show is about passion, sure. purpose, and potential, Michael. Right. And you are a man who left the corporate machine... I did. ...to become an entrepreneur, to follow your passion, how did you go from the corporate machine and being a sales executive to setting up an organization based on resiliency and engagement? Well, uh, to go back in time, at somewhere between five and eight, I had a, a brain injury. So off in the car, no ambulance. You know you live rural in the old days when there's no ambulance service. Down mm -hmm. to Sick Kids Hospital where I got hustled in and a few days later I got to go home. But it started me on my journey of how we all react to different things in so radically different ways. Mm -hmm. I since learned as an adult that head injuries either make you real quiet or make you really agitated. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I was the really quiet one. Hard to believe, Michael. I know, very hard to believe. You I were wanted, the quiet guy? I was the quiet guy, so Come I on. wanted the lights off, the noises to go yeah. away, and I had a headache that was eight miles wide and mm -hmm. ten miles deep, and I wanted my roommate who'd had a head injury, who was screaming incessantly, to just go away. And of course, I came home and I was like, wow. That really is interesting that two people, similar issues, and you couldn't have reacted any differently. So that got me thinking, but you're in grade one or grade two, and off you go, and for your viewers that I'm that old, that bicycle helmets weren't available then for the general public. So fast forward, and I had a medical condition at 17, and the doctor with good intentions said, well, there's nothing you can do. It's a chronic illness, and he never met my mother and father. He certainly didn't know my grandparents because you're not allowed to say in my family, there's nothing you can do. There's prayer and there's family and friends and there's exercise and there's diet. But, you know, sometimes when we're experts, we've got to be careful. We get tunnel vision. And I jokingly, respectfully refer to experts as a body of interest two inches wide and ten miles deep. And the nice thing about resiliency is it gets me to pay attention to ten miles of wide, but I'm only two inches deep, but I'm not shallow. So that got me really going because... I mystified the experts with the chronic illness because it kept disappearing. At a cellular level, I was really sick. But I had no symptoms sometimes for two and three years. Then I'd have a 90-day <clears throat> speed bump test. And uh, that made me think that, hmm, maybe this mind and matter thing, there's more to it. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, I had two bouts of cancer where I confounded the, the mental health professions because I was too happy. And I said, well... Oh, my gosh. I've got to share this with you. Please. I relate to this. Because when I was pregnant, I um, had a life-threatening ailment. And there was a good chance I wouldn't see my first and the baby I was carrying. And when they would come in to do rounds, I mean, you have to do something to keep your spirit up. Absolutely. I would make jokes. Ultimately, one of the doctors came to see me and told me off and said, don't you realize you're going to die? Like, <laughs> why are you joking every day? And that's what I dealt with with a mental health professional who, good intent, mm -hmm. said, but Michael, I've looked at your charts. You've got four cancer tumors. Stage three of the primary, one spread, stage three. Say goodbye. And two stage twos. Like, you're in deep trouble. I said, well, I already know I'm in deep trouble. But the day I got the diagnosis on the drive home, I stopped at the lawyer's office, got a new will, stopped at the real estate agent, said, in case I die, here's contact information for father-in-law and father and spouse's work number. And uh, you're going to do a good job, right? Poor guy. Drain, blood drained out and he almost fainted. <laughs> so you became a resiliency expert because I it's an innate talent. You were innately resilient. My family culture is that it's not nice to be, have an adversity and it's okay to feel what you feel, but then 
after you've understood and reflected on your feelings, yeah. what do you want to do and what do you have to do to fight through? Mm -hmm. So resiliency doesn't always change all the outcomes, but it always changes the quality of the experience. But would you not say that, you know, we live, somebody asked me a while ago, because my practice is all about helping smart people work, communicate, and lead smarter and happier. Absolutely. So there, there's a great synergy between Absolutely. what we do. Absolutely, yes. But somebody asked me, they said, I mean, when are we going to stop riding the wave of change? <laughs> the wave is only going to continue. That's why, you know, whether, I mean, my methodology is building the three Qs. Yours is resiliency. You need to find a way to really continue to ride the wave because it's, con it's continuing. And when you think about resiliency, I mean, it's not only health. It's in terms of um, health and well-being. I mean, it's, it's really, really critical, but within the machine and within entrepreneurship, engagement, communicating with influence, um, really being able to survive and thrive in this climate demands resiliency. Well, I had a client with a sales staff turnover problem, because in the olden days yeah. of the 90s, it took... Eh, four to nine sales calls to get a yes, no, not right now, it's not in the budget, yeah. but come back soon. And now, with some of their clients, it's taking 19 points of contact to get to that. And it's burning people out. And I said to them, it's great you've given all these people this amazing sales training, mm -hmm. very professional group. What have you done to help them with what I call mental stamina? Because mm -hmm. resiliency, it helps kids with grades and graduation rates, it helps them with behavior, it helps adolescents with university and handling things and doing the right thing instead of the wrong things in university when they're away from home. But in the corporate world, it's retention, it's absentee versus presenteeism versus engagement and Isn't high that productivity. Isn't a great term, presenteeism? For those people that don't know about presenteeism, this is a new term that was created um, with, that refers to people being present at their jobs but basically not doing anything. The body showed up and the mind's on holidays yeah. and so they do a little bit of work to get by but yeah. only it's enough a to get by. problem, yeah. So they went, well, but it's expensive to hire people. I said, well, it's really expensive to hire new staff, and it also makes your customers vulnerable. Because when I was in sales, I got some of my biggest captures and stole business away from the competitors when their salespeople changed over. Because mm -hmm. they had a bond and an emotional connection with their salespeople with high trust. I came along and for four years said, well, should you change things? We'd like a chance to talk. And I, all got, I got all sorts of business that nobody would gotten for 20 to 40 years away from the competition when their reps changed because I had a con an emotional connection and trust even though I wasn't their supplier and the new guy was just a new guy. So I have three questions for you. Please. Number one question. What would you say is the most important thing to developing resiliency? Well, hold on. What Michael Ballard... Are you passionate about in terms of the work you do? Is it keynotes? Is it training? Tell us about that. And also, I want your passionate tip for the day. Okay. Uh, one of the key things about being resilient is we live in a society, Dr. Helmstetter in the 80s brought it to my attention, that yes. something where upwards of 80% of what people think, what they say, is framed in the negative. So not a compliment of, oh, Irene, I like black, it but, suits you. But, oh, Irene, it'll show all the lint. Oh, Irene, are you sure? It, it'll show all the pilling eventually. That Oh, my gosh, now I'm self-conscious. Michael! It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. So, so in a world of, that focuses 80% of the time on the negatives, yeah. how do we make progress? So I also, with some clients, talk about realistic optimism. Because, you know, some people think that optimism or being positive is just this bright, sunshiny face. The clouds will go away. The sun will come out. <clears throat> Tomorrow. And it isn't that way. There's homework to be done. There's a process. So a key thing to be but resilient. But the homework can be fun. Oh, absolutely. So I get people to say, if there was a dictionary that was personal and private and your picture was there, what have you allowed and who have you allowed to help define who you currently think you are? Mm -hmm. Some of those things are positive in the truth. Some of those things are neutral half true, half but clutter and get in the way, and some are out and out lies. And so when I get people to do an inventory of how and who they've allowed to define themselves, some of these things really get in the way. My grade 10 math teacher, who had to retire the year after he taught us, 69% failure rate of all classes taught, nice man, chronic illness, undiagnosed, nice guy, lousy teacher. If I'd have believed him, I'm a 52% kid in math. <clears throat> no, I'm not. Next year's math teacher said, 
You want to be a bridge builder, an engineer? Want to be a rocket scientist? So you're good at business math. So he said, be careful of how you let others influence you in your thinking, Michael. Oh, that's such so, a key point. So, so he was really a powerful force in getting me to look at my self-definition that when yeah. it came to business math, I have exceptional skills, which in sales paid off real fast because mm -hmm. percentages. So you would help a client really see their strengths? Well, I help individuals, teams, groups, children, families. Yeah, because I work IBM, Government of Singapore, but I've also worked with foster parent groups, and I've worked with boards of so education. So tell me about your passion. I mean, it's doing training, it's doing coaching, it's doing keynotes, it's teaching people about resiliency, how to create greater engagement. When you look at your business and your vision, what is it that speaks to your heart? What is the next step for Michael Ballard? Uh, it's getting more exciting in that we're going to go to more media forms. Okay. In that helping people help themselves. You know, the old feed them a fish or teach them how to fish. Well, I'm having a lot of fun helping people learn how to fish and be their own resiliency resource. Mm -hmm. So I've got free experts with the Board of Education, and we're currently looking at my model and how it fits with their theory. And they said, but your model helps engage the kids. I said, wouldn't it be better to have 90% of the kids engaged and do 90% of what I advocate instead of 40% of the kids do what you do and use 10% because yours is nice, but it's dry, it's academic, and it's hard and unwieldy? And we know, you know, from brain science that engagement is really critical to ideation. It's critical to one of the cues, IQ. Oh, it's vital. And yeah. uh, I have an advertising guru on my team, and he talks about creating brain tattoos. And I, of course, I called it mental bookmarks so that when we need it, the answers and the right thing to do is right there. Mm -hmm. So whether we're working with children or youth or adults or I've done some nursing home work as well, it's there and it's available. So that's a key so, is self-definition. Michael, what is your tip? What do you want to tell the audience about resiliency? Resiliency is be wary, tip. be wary of how you frame and reframe things. Okay. And that's your point of view. And that's good to have a point of view, but there's always at least two or three points of view, and those points of view come with th feelings attached and methods of moving forward. Okay. So we should always, to be resilient, know our options. And focus on the positive. Yes. Yes, half empty is valuable and half full, but if we focus only on the half empty, yeah. we're stuck. Only in the half full, we're not being realistic. If we need to buy groceries next week, buying that cute pair of shoes or that nice new sports car might not be wise. I so, like the sports car. Oh, so I was going to buy a convertible. Okay, well, give me a ride. As <laughs> long as you can afford the payments. And I can put the top down. I will. Good. Michael Ballard, such a pleasure. I want you to tell our audience how they can reach you. Oh, sure. I, well, I'm on the web. If you uh, key in Michael Ballard or Resiliency for Life, you should find me in Toronto, Canada at www.resiliencyforlife.com. Okay.